So I just want to add my thanks. My name is uh, Bilal Bhatt. I'm from the University of Michigan, but um, I, uh, I'm from Kenya, just across the border. So very happy to be here. First time in Ethiopia. And I want to extend my thanks to the Ethiopian Biodiversity Institute uh, for their very, um, very nice uh, hosting of us. And we appreciate it very much. And we look forward to more interactions with you. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to talk to you about something that you will not find in any textbook. Okay? And it's not something that you can Google either. And this is about figuring out the history of people and protected areas in Sub-Saharan Africa. Now, everyone assumes that a national park magically assumes and somehow or another local people are bad for protected areas. And I want you to dispel that from your minds and think afresh about the nature of the relationship between people and protected areas. Does that sound okay with everyone? Good. All right. Now, I've got to stay in my box here. Um, there are 105,000 protected areas around the world. Just think about that. 105,000 protected areas around the world. You have 92 here in Ethiopia. That's just pretty large, actually. And you've got 14% of the land area in protected areas. If we look at this graph, you can see that the era of protected area conservation really starts in the 1940s and then peaks in around 1995 and then declines after that. So this begs some interesting questions in and of itself, which is, you know, well, which kind of national park? Which kind of protected area? And there are different kinds of protected areas. Not only that, but for the vast history of protected area conservation, it has been the state that has been primarily responsible for nature conservation. Okay? In Ethiopia, you have uh, the Ethiopian Wildlife Conservation Authority. Am I saying that correctly? that is responsible for nature conservation. The state has been largely responsible for nature protection. But how did we get to this point of having so many protected areas? And are they actually functioning in the way that we intend? And certainly, Town and, and Mona have discussed a little bit about, you know, maybe that wasn't so clear cut as what we think. And I'm going to make you more confused about that by looking at some of the history of these things. And so when we look at the history of protected area conservation, and this is largely I'm talking about in sub-Saharan Africa, that is countries that are south of the Sahara in Africa. Um, in, prior to the 1900s, we had what were called local forms of resource access, right? Indigenous people that relied on some form of natural resource utilization, right? Around the 1920s, especially in East, Southern, and Central Africa, there was large-scale hunting that occurred, okay? Which also affected wildlife uh, areas. In the 1960s, across the continent, we start implementing what is called fortress conservation. It was also known as the fences and fines approach to conservation, which is what it sounds like. If you enter a national park, you get hit with a fine or you get evicted. In the 1980s, some of you may remember that there was a very huge poaching crisis and we had lots of different policies that were used to eradicate uh, poaching. And in the 1990s, we, had so we, we looked back on that era of, of um, the first poaching crisis and we said that wasn't very successful. And here what we really need is to bring communities much more back into conservation. And this were called integrated conservation and development programs. They were also known by community-based natural resource management, ICDPs and CBNRNs. Now, lately, you've been seeing in the news that South Africa, for example, has had 1,300 rhinos killed this year, right? And South Africa is one of the countries that has a very large, very dedicated protected area system. And so we don't seem to be doing a very good job. And this is leading us to a new era, which is what we call the era of environmental securitization, okay? So I'm going to go through these a little bit and take notes and ask us questions later, please. Don't hesitate. So prior to colonialism, and of course this is very different here in Ethiopia where, where you had a different set of, uh, of colonial entities than you did in um, much of sub-Saharan Africa, but these were largely what we call common pool resources, which means that land is managed collectively, right? And you certainly see this in the case of the Borana pastoralists in southern Ethiopia, but also elsewhere. And there's a difference here between saying that land is owned communally which is not owned by anyone and anyone can use it and therefore degrading the commons and what we call res communis which is common property owned collectively and only a certain group has access to that okay 
So when it comes to natural areas protected thinking, they've largely focused on this, thinking that land is not owned by anyone and that anyone can use it and simply degrade it. And that just isn't true for a vast majority of pastoral systems and other systems as well. Right? And so even prior to colonialism, prior to the 1900s, there were indigenous ways of sort of having reserve grazing pastures, for example. So in Kenya, we have the Maasai and what was known as the Olokeri, which was called a reserve grazing pasture. So notions of protectionism were very much clear even before national parks became evident. Right? And there were rules regarding resource access and control, and there were sanctions for people that did not adhere to the rules. Okay? And this existed for you know, 3,000 years prior to colonialism. Now, at the same time, indigenous people weren't all good, right? And there were some forms of hunting. And the biggest example of this is an old Arab slave trader, a guy called Tibu Tib, who was responsible for um, ivory and slave trading. And in this, you know, there were vast amounts of ivory that were being harvested. Right? And you can see how big this tusk was and how big the elephant had to be for that tusk. Right? So we know that there was some resource extraction that had been going on prior to the 1900s. Around the 1920s, there becomes this colonial and European fascination with big game hunters. Right? And the, the reason for this is when Britain, for example, and Italy over here took over countries, they needed a way for the country to pay for itself. Right? And so sometimes that was through plantations like coffee and tea, but other times it was through wildlife. And there was this harvesting of zebra pelts and cheetah pelts, and leopard pelts, and ivory, and elephant foot waste paper baskets. Right? And this is still occurring. You can still go into a shop in Tanzania and buy a zebra skin rug. You can still do this. Okay? Now, we seem to have this fascination with the big game hunter, and none more so than the former American president, Teddy Roosevelt, who in 1909 would sit in the front of a steam engine and shoot any animal that he came across while going from Mombasa to Nairobi. And mm, we were so fascinated with this and had no idea of what effect this would have on local uh, wildlife populations that one great example is the British colonial authority in Kenya commissioned this guy, his name was J.A. Hunter. Convenient name, he was a hunter. But J.A. Hunter was commissioned by the British colonial authority to reduce the number of rhinos in the country because they were, the rhinos were overpopulated, according to British colonial thinking. And so he was commissioned to kill 936 rhinos. And so he piled all these rhinos together and it looked like a big mountain. Right? And that tells you some of where the ideas of protected areas come from, that it was not indigenous people who had decimated wildlife populations, but it was largely the era of big game hunters. Remember, we're still in the 1920s and 1940s. Okay? And this is still occurring today. You can book a safari in, what, in Tanzania uh, through companies called Robin and Hood Safaris and you, see, you saw all the, all the media attention that was given to Cecil the lion, right? And this is, so this is still going on again and so, so much have we become enamored with the notion of the big game hunters that we have video games now for big game hunting. You can pay, play video games called The Hunter. And so this takes us now to the 1960s. And in the 1960s, we really started to develop further this idea of fortress conservation, this fences and fines approach to conservation. So where did this idea come from? It came from America. This was an ideal that was imported from the Yellowstone ecosystem. And here you have US Army Rangers who were confiscating the heads of, of buffalo and bison. And this was the way in which protected areas were conceived is that you needed a well-armed force to stop poachers. Now, during this time in East Africa, local people were largely treated by colonial authorities as being detrimental to wildlife. They were thought of as the poachers. And so, if you read new books like this one by Jan Shetler called Imagining Serengeti, she talks about how this whole Serengeti ecosystem, which we think of as pristine, 
has actually been produced by pastoralists, right? And so there is this huge ecological history that is being uncovered and what's strange about it is even though the Serengeti ecosystem was created by people, the wildebeest migration, which you've all heard of and seen some of on television, the first migration only took place in 1961. It has not something that has been occurring for the last 2000 years. And so to create a protected area, you have to expel indigenous people because they thought that pastoralists in particular were very bad for the environment and led to overgrazing. And new research is telling us that that simply isn't true. So there were drastic declines in, this is elephant numbers, that was responsible for um, then poaching takes place and, and the elephant numbers drop and pictures like this were common across newspapers and magazines in North America and elsewhere. But throughout all of this there was a war that was declared on poachers. Yet we had no idea who a poacher actually is. And we still don't know. We don't know who a poacher is. Right? It's usually somebody who is poor. And so continuing on with the fortress conservation, you needed well-stocked well armies to essentially make sure that the ecosystem was protected from these threats, of which people wrongly diagnosed as being local people were responsible for. And why? Because tourism, was, tourism wildlife-based tourism, was so important to the economy in Ethiopia here in, in yesterday's newspaper, or I think it's today's newspaper, uh, you will find an article where 4% uh, of uh, Ethiopia's GDP is being derived from tourism and Ethiopia wants to grow that. And so how do you do that? You have to safeguard wildlife for tourists, not for local people, for tourists. And as a result, there were large human rights abuses, there were forced dislocation from where people lived, and, you know, this is a, an article from, in the New York Times from 1989, which was really about the poaching crisis. And it starts off by saying, during a two-day shooting spree last month, a gang of ivory poachers with semi-automatic weapons butchered nearly 50 elephants in Savo National Park. Right? Now, you can find the same headline occurring today. In fact, I think it was a couple of months ago, it was uh, 150 elephants that were poisoned to death with cyanide in Zimbabwe. All right? And all of this now, the researchers were watching this very carefully and they said, well, this is a very horrible type of conservation and we actually called it coercive conservation. And there were many, many people that had written about this. And one of those was to think about um, who is in charge of wildlife agencies, right? And in Kenya, we instituted a, a shoot to kill policy, right? And here, Questions like who are the poachers, where do they derive their claims and the support, and all these other questions were left unanswered. So we have a shoot to kill policy for poachers, but we still don't know who a poacher actually is. And you can see the human rights abuses that arise from that. Uh, this is one of the more famous images at that time, President Moy setting fire to, I think it was 200 tons of, of ivory. And you see this periodic display happening in lots of African countries. Um, almost on a yearly basis. So under pressure from um, a lot of NGOs and human rights officials, they said, no, 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 you can't go about doing conservation this way. You have to involve local communities. And thus, thus began this era of integrated conservation and development. And here the idea was that you bring local communities back into conservation by decentralizing, devolving power to local communities. And you had examples like buffer zones where you had have a core area where no people were allowed and then you had buffer areas and movement corridors and that local people would populate the areas around that. And another way that they would involve local people is to give them an economic incentive and that largely occurred through tourism opportunities. Now opportunities like this are great but it doesn't al allow for any sort of advancement, right? People get stuck doing the same thing over and over and over again. Uh, and so, unsurprisingly, this did not decline the stems in wildlife and actually the devolution of power actually led to greater corruption and mismanagement. So, the one argument was you need to devolve power back to local communities, but what had happened as a result was when you devolve power and there's less oversight from the central state, peop uh, there was a li greater likelihood that there would be greater corruption. Okay? And so, uh, the academics have looked at this and they've looked at the reviews and it says, um, 
that an analysis of many integrated conservation and development plans has shown that successes to tend to be fleeting and fragile, meaning they have very, very, very few, I mean, you can count the number of successful integrated conservation and development projects in Africa on one hand, okay? And one of, so, so that brings us now until the 1990s and 2000s. And one of the trends that's happening now, how am I doing on time? Good, okay. Um, what I want to argue now is that you have had these two big eras of conservation. And now what you see happening across Sub-Saharan Africa is a third wave, which is predicated on what we call neoliberalism and the environment, which is where you bring private investment to come in Land that has been communally owned now then gets owned privately, and that private land is essentially forming private national parks. So historically, the state has always had control over protected areas, and now you have an era where the state is no longer the primary protector of nature. It is essentially a private national park with private security guards, private rangers, private surveillance. Right? And the idea here is that if you take this, then you can actually provide payments better to local people. The argument here is that privatization makes things better. Because you go, you bypass the sort of, the inefficiencies of the state. Um, what I would like to argue is that this is actually a continuation of a coercive conservation policy program. And we can, we can talk more about that, but in sum, it's basically associated with a, a larger program on land grabbing. It's a, it's a form of land grabbing, okay? And so, so this isn't, again, it's not unique. The examples that I've drawn most of my research on are from Kenya, but this is a sign that says, now selling your own private game reserve. And this is outside Hotspur Air, Airport, uh, which is neighboring Kruger National Park in South Africa, right? And so how does this happen? You have land that is communally owned. Once that communal owned, get, owned land gets subdivided and privatized, private neoliberal investors start leasing that land and essentially creating these private national parks. But they're, they're not friendly when it comes to allowing people to use those resources. In fact, they become more strict and in many cases continue the rights abuses that have happened in the past. Okay. And so as a result, we see regular what are called incursions into protected areas. I, do, I like to think about them not as incursions, but actually as reversions because the land was theirs before. So they're simply going back to what they were doing. And you see examples of this uh, private protected area spaces. You have places like Old Pejeta Conservancy in northern Kenya, which is uh, rhino breeding facilities. These are very rare. Thank you. These are very rare rhinos. These are northern white rhinos. We only have three of them left in the world. Um, the fourth one just died in a zoo in San Diego. But the other big thing that is happening now when it comes to wildlife conservation in Sub-Saharan Africa is a flawed link that is being put together which links terrorism and ivory poaching. And this largely came about following the Westgate, Westgate attacks in Nairobi in 2013, where a lot of people speculated, given the advanced planning of the terrorist attack and how long the terrorist attack ended, uh, lasted, the question here came out is that they had to have significant money. These terrorists had to have significant money to plan an attack like this. And where was that money coming from? And so uh, a lot of news outlets started saying that that money was coming from ivory poaching. Now, again, this was not unique to East Africa. This is through an organization called the Royal United Services Institute, which is in, in London. And they are introducing this concept called stabilization through conservation. And you take conflict prone areas, areas where you have rebel groups, insurgent groups, and so on, and you stabilize those areas by creating national parks. And this is a program called StableCon. And it's being promoted by a lot of um, uh, think tanks around the world. Now, when it came to this notion of the link between terrorism and the illegal trade in ivory, uh, the researchers from that institute, the Royal, in Royal United Services Institute for Defense and Security Studies, is they clearly point out that this linkage between ivory poaching and terrorism is a false linkage. And they say there it's a flawed narrative. There is no way that Al-Shabaab, for example, could actually get that much attention, that much money from ivory poaching. 
But that now is seen as a new wave of conservation. And I think we should be very, very careful about these links that we don't investigate thoroughly and that have huge repercussions for local people. And you see, so this is from 2010. Um, and a study from the University of Manchester showed that private security firms and mercenaries were being used to train game rangers. So it's a very troubling trend and we have to be very, very careful and really push back against ideas that seem to think that increased security is the answer. Um, there are even differences between the United Nations Environment Program and the um, International Police Force, Interpol. And there are very public disputes that occur between these two. And one will say that there is a link, another will say that there isn't a link. Okay? So, that's really depressing and horrible. And so, I'm going to end <laughs> by speculating on what the future of protected areas and conservation might be in Sub-Saharan Africa. Now, in areas where you do have a large tourism base and you have a large amount of endemic flora and fauna, and there is the need to protect that, what is the best way to go about conserving? And the answer to that will occur in the next 12 days of this course. <laughs> <laughs> so, so I will end there and um, if we have time, take one question and then um, I think we're gonna take a break. Okay, great, thank you all very much. <laughs>